<clears throat> Welcome back to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. I'm your host, AP. And today is Christmas Eve 2020. I know for many, for most, it's a special day today. The holidays are a special time. It's the end of a year and the beginning of a new one for many. And as such, certain rituals take place convenings, gatherings, a time of communion. This episode is, um, I don't know how short or how long to make it, really, because this episode is really just an advisory. It's a parental advisory. It's a Listener's advisory. Listener's discretion is highly advised. In no way I'm, am I making any threats. I'm just exposing them. I'm just making you aware to the threat. Because it's always been there. People just choose to forget them during the year. During the rest of the year. But... There are those times like the end where those threats become more emergent, if you will. I believe I'm four episodes into the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Some of them have been a little high speed. Some of them not so much. If at any point I talk too slow... You can speed it up if you have the option to. I would suggest it, recommend it even. Move it up to one and a quarter speed or one and a half times speed. But this is a, um, <clears throat> this episode is special to me because at the end of the year, because it is the end of the year currently uh, here in the United States where we're based and and it's an important time it's the opportunity to reflect it's the opportunity to to plan for the future it's the opportunity to to get together and review review where we've come from the advancements that we've made our accomplishments our achievement whether or not progress has been satisfactory and make decisions from there. (laughs) Make orders, make new orders from there. Why is it a parental advisory? Why is it a listener's, why is there a listener's advisory? Why is this, why does it come to the forefront? Because the end of the year for many is a time of uncertainty and In a previous episode, I said that uncertainty might lead to uncomfortableness and some people just can't cope or don't cope effectively with discomfort, with being uncomfortable. And that in itself, while a problem, is is solvable, though it requires a level of understanding that's really discretionary to everybody. Now, I won't claim that I'm set for life. I can't claim that I'm set for life. There's a um, there's a rule from where I'm from. There's a rule in, in our line of work It says don't make um, contracts where the term, like the time turn is for life. (laughs) 
where it's the term of uh, of life because one never knows how long life is. <clears throat> My apologies again. If I'm speaking too slow, I'm doing so to avoid um, getting too enthusiastic, getting too excited, getting too excited, and uh, and and cursing or using unprofessional language, I suppose. So I'm having to think a little more before I speak. It all has to do with the very first episode where I said this is really more for myself. It's a more it's more of a tool for myself in order to better develop my speech, better develop my modes of argumentation, better develop myself as a professional, as a representative, as a corporate cowboy, if you will. Parental parental guidance. Parental guidance is advised. Parental advisory. I say that because many of our partners, of our associates, our affiliates might be parents, some of them prospective parents, some planning on having one in the future. But we all came from somewhere. We've all had parents whether or not they were related to us by blood or otherwise. That said, parental advisory, that advisory should have always been there for us. And it's a very, it's an extremely low number for those that haven't. And um, my heart breaks for those, but my heart can't break for everybody. So while I might give so my so while I might seldomly give second chances, it's 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 a rare it's a rarity. But parental advisory and why that's important is because this is a time for for warmth. This is a time for appreciation. This is a time for togetherness. This is a time for families to hug themselves close, come together, live together, partake in whatever festivities it is they engage at this time of the year from whatever denomination they might claim. A parental advisory to those parents who have kids. Bring them up. It's on you to bring them up as corporate cowboys. It might be too late for you. It's never too late for them. It's never too late for you either. Though, readjustment brings discomfort. And few can cope with being uncomfortable, always. I get it. It's that stability that we seek. Does not matter how stable, does not matter how stable one wants to make their family. Children will want to splinter off. Children will want to leave the nest. Children will want to carve their own path. And thus, it's up to you to be able to advise them as parents, to guide them effectively and tell them, show them, teach them, instruct them on what the world has in store for them. Again, I'm not a threatening guy. I try to take it easy. I'm very calm, collected, and cool until I'm not. So a parental advisory. (laughs) Notice how this (laughs) took a sudden turn. 
from asking you to advise to advising you, advising your friends as a friend. If you have friends with kids, pass this on to them. If you're under 18 and somehow got your hands on this recording, on this on this podcast, and you're wanting to get involved, you want to get started early. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. Share this with your family. Share this with your parent. Let them know the kind of conscientious villains that exist. This is only an advisory. This is only an advisory. Teach your children. Help them grow. Because if you don't, And, they, and it comes time for them to fend for themselves, to live on their own. They'll meet someone like me, a corporate cowboy. Now, I'm not going to claim to be good. I'm not going to claim to be bad. I'm an individual. And as an individual, I have my own set of ethics, my own code of conduct some of which you'll learn, some of which you might not over the course of this episode, over the life of this podcast. But you have to realize that you can't be in your kid's life all day, every day. Sooner or later, they walk out of the house and don't come back. I mean, for stretches of time. And it starts young. They go to school first. What is it, kindergarten? Five, six hours a day, they're away. Who do you think is taking care of them? A teacher? Somebody who cares? Maybe. A corporate cowboy with a with an agenda even it's possible just a drone pushing propaganda just doing their job it's a high probability of any of those instances of any of those circumstances being a reality. Middle school, high school, they're away from the house, eight hours a day, possibly longer if they're in some sort of extracurricular activity, if they choose to associate and hang out with quote unquote friends. Yeah, I did a lot of that. I have nothing to show for it. I have no school trophies. I have a criminal record. <laughs> so that should tell you where my priorities were. It should tell you how I prioritized my time, my energy. And I wasn't a bad student. Sure, I got expelled. But even then, I was able to finish high school on time, if not a bit early. Came out with my diploma. If not, I would have still got the GED. Just for the hell of it, just to have it. These are just things to have but you don't need them. You don't absolutely need them to eat. Trust me, there are other ways to eat. I was eating in high school and I hadn't even graduated. Parental advisory for those who don't raise their kids, right? For those who don't 
teach them, guide them, instruct them on what life is like. It'll be me that shows them what death looks like, how that works. Why? Because I'm not in the business of, of, of life and death. I'm in the business of business. And that's the entire spectrum. The positivity should come from the household, from the family. Something they could come back to and, and feel some warmth. Feel minimal comfort. A minimal measure of comfort. Something they could feel familiar in. The family. La familia. If they don't feel that, they'll find it somewhere else. They'll find it from individuals like myself. I don't know what it was about my household that drove me to find not so much solace, but drove me to find connection outside of the family. And it wasn't so much that I was a troublemaker. Maybe I had too much family. Maybe I had too much love and felt I need to share it with those in the classroom who I saw were the troublemakers. And that's how I became associated with them. Yeah, I was told early on, I don't look like a gangster. I don't look like a thug. I don't look like somebody who runs the streets. I look like a good person. Ultimately, that's probably because I was raised by good people. Again, I came from, if not a religious family, a highly superstitious family. One who, who believed in reaping what we sowed. One who believed in owing debts and paying them whether we wanted to or not. One who believed in accidents for everything that happened, there was a belief. And in that way, we were grounded. Our lives based in reality, not only theory, not only superstition, we could back it up with something empirical, something tangible. I hear a lot of talk about socialism and communism and fascism and what all that means coming from an outside authority. I'm no authority. I hold no sway over your life. Though I might influence it with a few words, I'm more than likely to simply inform you than to insist or to enforce. That's all I'm here for. It's just to inform you. It's just for myself to practice running through rationale, practice, employing syllogism, being able to chain together a string of thoughts. It's all they are, just words, letters, laced together, sewn up, threaded, woven into a tapestry of what has become our society or braided into a line and used as a fucking garrote <laughs> <laughs> to choke the life out of the unsuspecting. That was a, that used to be a tactic 
one that I picked up. I wasn't so much taught. But when you're able to set somebody up with just words and in real time and have them walk into it or talk themselves into it, it's a thing of art. It's a thing of art. That's an entire episode on itself. That's an entire episode on its own. And it should be. It ought to be. So I'll make a mental note. It isn't often that I'm able to break away at this hour and put a couple of ideas down on paper. Man, I have notes for days or now that I'm doing audio it won't be often that I'm able to get away and produce an episode yeah the budget is low I have no budget so I could be over budget all the time or I could be under budget but I'm not gonna over promise I plan to over deliver all the time. The game is to under promise and over deliver. Am I right? So the production value isn't poor, let's say. It's just not there. You must understand that this conversation that we're having is all one sided. And you chose that by clicking play. You knew what the implications were coming in. That listening to a podcast is not the same as a discussion. The back and forth. An exchange of ideas. There's no real exchange going on here. No real interaction. Again... It's just serving as a log of my adventures into corporate, of my venture into fulfilling my mission, accomplishing my objective as a corporate cowboy. But there's hundreds. There's thousands. Whether or not they choose to come out of the woodwork, that's really on them. It might be up to me to go out and introduce myself. No biggie. That could be done. But again, parental advisory is don't waste your time on menial or minimal, I guess, pleasantries. There's rarely any time for pleasantries. Even a celebration in corporate, it's short-lived. It's quick. It's to the point. Clink, clink. Bottoms up. You're done. Next job. Parental advisory is you bringing not just your offspring, but you as a listener, listener's discretion is you holding yourself accountable, holding others accountable with just a couple of words. You don't have to go out of your way and make a scene. Just gotta tell them privately in person. I mean, always understand the risk and in context, If you're a a smaller person, you don't have any leverage on you. Is it worth it? Obviously, you have to choose, pick and choose your battles. But if you can, and you believe you must, in order to ensure that business runs right, in order to ensure that business is always bettering, Then you take it upon yourself. Use discretion. 
listener's discretion. When I was younger, yeah, here's the thought. When I was younger and I first learned the word peer, P-E-E-R, like peer pressure, I understood it immediately when it was explained to me. Immediately, I understood it. I internalized it, what peer pressure was. Why? It wasn't so much of the peer word. It was the pressure word. Again, I didn't look like I came from the street. I didn't look hard. I didn't look like a thug. I didn't look menacing, intimidating. I was a little nobody. I was skinny, little wiry. I was a pushover. You could argue I was told I was a good boy because I followed orders. And in that way, I knew what pressure was and I didn't care who it came from. My peers consisted of persons younger than me and older. Age did not make a difference. If somebody younger than me asked me for something or was pressuring me to do something and they started up with the waterworks, is that not pressure? Now, the waterworks or when you're crying, when you're actually spilling tears, also might work when you're older, though maybe not as convincingly. But there are other ways to put pressure on somebody who's young, on a young and impressionable mind when you're older. Just the simple fact of threatening them, of threatening to label one as not good anymore, as a bad boy or a bad person or somebody who doesn't listen and doesn't pay attention. We all want to be good. We all want to do right. We all need that validation, don't we? So I could have been seven and this peer pressure could have been coming from somebody who was 99. Though if you ever explain it like that, very few, very few will want to admit, exceedingly few will want to admit that's who your peers are. Your peers are are meant to be, are supposed to be those one or two years above or below where you are. Ooh, your peers. Or your peers are supposed to be those in your immediate social circle. I never kept a consistent social circle. I learned from everybody. I associated with everyone young, early on. I had those that type of parents who said, um, who insisted that I introduce myself whenever I was visiting a, a foreign household, a stranger's household, a new household, insisted that I introduce myself to everyone there by name, get their name, and to speak with them, to speak with the adults, not to stray far from the adults. I think a lot of that had to do with my parents knowing the inquisitive and adventurous and explorative minds of, of children. And so that kept us out of cupboards and out of people's rooms. For that, I thank them because it ingrained a sense of respect for other person's property. And so in doing so, I became exceedingly comfortable, increasingly comfortable speaking with those in positions higher than myself. Why? Because at that age, 
titles and positions did not matter to me. I didn't care. Your age didn't matter to me. Your name, what you look like, your name and your face is all that mattered. How you spoke, how you stood, the language you conveyed, the message you conveyed through the language, verbal or physical, that's what mattered. And this all helped me early on. Later in life, came in clutch. As a corporate cowboy, I've had many successes. I've had many setbacks and failures. Obviously more successes than failures because I'm still here to tell you all about it. But the parental advisory, the advisory again comes up in that you have to hold each other responsible, each other as individuals. Even now at this age, my parents try to hold me responsible. I try to hold my parents responsible. Some lessons I learned when I was younger turned out to be false, turned out to be wrong. So can you imagine me having to correct old people? <laughs> I mean that in a completely respectful manner. I mean that with no offense. But trying to teach old dogs new tricks kind of situation. Trying to rationalize with the very ones who raised me, the very ones who believe that I owe them respect without question. It's difficult, but again, I use what I learned as a young one, peer pressure, in order to argue my point, in order to debate a point. If a topic of discussion comes up and I have them over for dinner or I'm over at theirs, we meet for a small gathering and some topic of controversy should come up. They learn that I have a different point of view, a different side. I have my own dog in a fight. And in a sense, I get that, yeah, they are proud because I became my own individual and at the same time, well, I don't know if they learn. They might just become confused. But with confusion comes discomfort. With discomfort comes growth. Becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I don't know if they have time to grow because we're all getting older. And I know when I was younger, the constant sense of being uncomfortable. Do you ever learn completely? Do you ever completely understand a lesson? It's hard. It's difficult. Parents really can only teach their children the fundamentals, the basics of how to get started. Essentially, that's what school's supposed to be doing too. School is supposed to and meant to supplement the instruction and, and the exposition of a parent's role in a child's life. Some parents opt to just let their kids run wild into school. And that's fair game, really. If fairness and justice and right and wrong are all subjective to relativity, that's fair. Why? Because they'll meet kids like me 
they'll meet people like me. And um, we'll associate. That's where I thrive. That's just additional gray area. I'm not claiming to pray. I'm not claiming to be a predator. I'm not claiming to victimize. I'm just saying I see an opportunity in someone who's whose upbringing might have not been the most fruitful, I see some hope. I always see a little bit of light in where there might not be. I always see a little bit of gray where it could be. For better or for worse, You don't discipline your kids, or you were never disciplined, you'll meet motherfuckers like me. And learning the hard way, well, that was always a threat in my household. You either learn the easy way, or you learn the hard way. And the easy way wasn't even always easy. It took a little longer to understand what learning items like patience, learning items like forgiving, learning items like sacrifice. And where my parents might have succeeded, other parents have fallen short other parents have failed, or kids have opted, young people, I'm gonna call them now, young people have opted not to listen. They believe that there's an easier way. They believe that there is a way where there are no consequences. There are always consequences. You reap what you sow even if your parents never taught you. Consequences exist, even if you don't know about them. It's analogical, I suppose, to the story of, to the story of the pioneer, the old West pioneer. First teaching um, the natives about Jesus Christ. Before that analogy, just a quick word from our sponsors. I don't know if I'll have a an episode this week. Um, today's Christmas Eve, the 24th. Today is Thursday, December 24th, 2020. And I don't know if I'll have one later this week or I might hold off until... Well, actually, later this week is only one day until Christmas or hold off until the weekend, maybe Monday. But it's a special occasion, it being the holidays. So, this sponsor is, obviously, I don't have any corporate sponsors yet. This sponsor is a, uh, is a private sponsor, and it's really love. This podcast is sponsored by love. That's why I do it. I know it's a little hard to grasp in relation to corporate what does love have to do with it <laughs> but a second hand emotion <laughs> but it's the same as hate it's the same as hate if you don't love you can't hate it's no love and it's no hate but it's one and the same 
being better means loving to do it right and hating when it goes wrong otherwise what would be the incentive what would be the motivation if it if you had no emotion or you had no reaction to when it went wrong what's the incentive to even do it better i just said it feels right if the baseline was always neutral what's the incentive other than it feeling good feeling good is never just in the incentive there are many many things that we as individuals appreciate and enjoy take pleasure in because they feel good whether they be physical spiritual carnal some type of vice but we're not doing them all the time even though they feel good we'll return to a baseline and and withhold what is it we'll hold back and not do it and then there are those items that obviously cause us pain and we want to not have happen those items that are bad we must learn to hate in order to prevent them and do something about it yeah i get it love and hate overused in our society oh i love this oh i hate them <laughs> few few can appreciate the gravity of what it means to love and hate there are so many other words for them adore intrigued emulate idolize odious but this episode is brought to you by the love of those who want to continue to do better and it's not even to do right you see what I'm saying it's just to do better because what's right for some is bad for others <laughs> yes business is war it is a zero-sum game but if you approach it with love and the want to do better it doesn't matter who's against you it really doesn't because you can appreciate what you're doing and you'll do it wholeheartedly Well, thanks for sticking around. This is the second half of episode four. Listener's discretion is advised or parental advisory. I'm still up in the air between those two titles. But um, yeah, l listener's uh, discretion is advised. And that reminds me of, um, I forget where I heard this freaking story from, but it had to do with uh, the early settlers of the West I guess the OG cowboys <laughs> and um, and how they were bringing the message of our of the Lord and Savior to the natives while they're fulfilling their manifest destiny in that time Native Americans had no um, what is it? Had no single, I guess, godhead or 
no single um how do you call it i guess messiah that they prayed to or or worshiped and settlers when they came across and began to either assimilate or incorporate integrate with the tribes you know they weren't all fucking killers even though many many tribes and Indians Native Americans were decimated they weren't all killers some of them came to convert (laughs) and in doing so they were able to persuade and convince in a very logical and a very rational fashion able to persuade Native Americans to abandon previous beliefs, beliefs that they'd been raised on their entire life, that they came up with their entire life and able to to wasn't enabled them to appreciate what the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus Christ had taken up when they were sent down and crucified by their own father, if you will. On one such occasion, the story goes that a settler was just getting done and um, this was one of those, uh, I guess, uh, meetings or times of communion before such a baptism, you know, to uh, really consummate and complete the conversion in which they were explaining and extolling on the Native American the significance of Jesus Christ in relation to the world. The pain, the suffering, not only the miracles performed, but ultimately how Jesus Christ was sent to Calvary, strung up, crucified, and um, pretty much put on display for the sake of the world, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of those sentient and conscious to understand. And the Native American breaks down cries becomes overwhelmed with emotion unable to to hold back control the the tears finally I guess between sobs blurts out is it true? is it all true? and the parishioner, if you will, said, yes, absolutely. You have to believe it with your heart in order to internalize that message of Christ. And the Native American breaks down again, unable to control himself. Finally, wiping a tear from his eye, They ask again. If I hadn't known of Jesus Christ before, when as a child I came up to worship nature, appreciate the sun and the cycle of life, if I had not known of this sacrifice of Jesus Christ, Would I still be living in sin? Would I still be damned? Would I be not saved? And the parishioner was taken aback by this question. Essentially, after having explained to the Native American where original sin had came from and how we as humans are all born 
into it are all born from it and born into it in its continuance was asking if they had not known about Jesus Christ before the parishioner had told them about it were they doomed were they damned and the parishioner says I suppose if you didn't know then you would not be damned you would need the knowledge you would need to have the knowledge you would need to be cognizant of who Jesus Christ was in order to accept them would you not and the Native American falls out again questioning their existence unsure of what to do with themselves at that time probably felt like having the wool pulled from your eyes and cries out to the parishioner then why did you tell me about him <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> listener's discretion is highly advised parental advisory is highly advised parental advisory is insisted teach your kids guide your kids so that they aren't taught that they aren't misguided that they aren't misoriented that they don't become disoriented and question where they came from. In that story, between the parishioner, could have been a priest or a pastor, and the Native American, who was in the right? Who was right? Who was wrong? <laughs> yeah, these are, these are the kind of conversations that I'll have with other associates. And yeah, there might be a little argument, a little discussion between those with a denomination and those who who don't might not adhere to one or the other. Ultimately, <laughs> it comes down to betterment. To betterment. Was the Native American better off for having learned of Jesus Christ almost pressured into accepting them? How do they become peers? Were they now peers? <laughs> Was the parishioner any better off for, for the answer that they gave? <laughs> yeah. It's just more to contemplate. More about the gray area. Many incorporate don't believe or don't adhere, aren't, aren't religious. I believe it gets to, um, to extremes, to certain extremes in life where existence is questioned, purpose, purpose is questioned, divinity, divinity is questioned. And it's not to say God doesn't exist. I know God exists. But that's another, that's a whole other episode on whether or not God exists and what the hell they're doing in corporate. <laughs> oh man. Parental discretion is advised. It's honestly the last time I want to say it. But I doubt it'll be the last time I will say it. Just want to remind those who are parents or are looking to become parents how you ought to structure your life, how I am bringing you to your Lord and Savior, whoever that might be. Notice I'm leaving out names. It could be anybody. It could be anybody. It could be a, a, a faceless nameless individual or entity 
like corporate. <laughs> but as a corporate cowboy, the goal is to hold one another responsible in the continuance of business, in the continuance of capitalism, in the continuance of opportunity creation. Not, not equalization. We aren't all equal. We aren't all equal. We might all be humans. Humans aren't all equal. We might all be brothers and sisters and not at all equal. But we should be working towards becoming better. Ultimately, that's my life's mission. That's honestly how corporate began. That's how the United States began. And the United States is one large company with a president and a vice president, if you will. <laughs> and then they got departments in this corporation. And all of those have department heads, chiefs. All those are qualifiably vice presidents. It's just a matter of secession. But if you aren't doing better, if you're simply extracting, if you're simply manipulating, if you're only creating peer pressure and not creating a benefit, you aren't a part of corporate. You're a fucking parasite inside of corporate. But that's another episode right there. How many episodes I got? I'm all fucking like eight. I got eight lined up and I'm on my fourth. Your boy's got a lot of work to do. But I like how the tone of this one went. It's a little not lighthearted, but it's a little bit easier on the ears if I might say so myself. It's me. I told you I would practice different tones, different tempos, different modes of speech, accents even. I can't really do languages because, well, my audience, I expect, would understand English. But I want to leave you all with a simple message, and that is advisory is always present. People choose, choose at one point, chose to ignore it. And look where we are now. <laughs> now you got splinters like myself, cowboys like myself. Not really splinters, I guess. Splinters implies that corporate cowboys are a nuisance. But hey, when you're doing right, it's someone else's wrong. And you are, I suppose, necessarily a nuisance to them. And when you're a corporate cowboy, you are the little guy. You are the independent. You are... The individual, you might move in a group, but uh, corporate is is a machine, is a giant machine. Whether or not you're inside it or not, corporate is a whale. Whereas, you know, we're just regular sized sharks. But even in that, there's power. That'd be a thought. That'd be an image, right? A whale swallowing a shark and the shark just dining, <laughs> just eating its way out. <laughs> oh, geez. That's another episode, actually. Okay, nice. All right, I, I, got, I got that one, actually. It was a thin, thin thread, a thin line, but I got it. Okay. 
plenty episodes coming in the future. This is by no means the end. This is only the beginning. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Kwanzaa. Whatever it is you celebrate. And a joyous new year from corporate. Love, Alex.